seizure or the epilepsy and seizure lecture is going to be a bit different. I, I'll talk a little bit about causes, triggers of epilepsy and the underlying mechanisms, but I thought it'd be a bit more fun to go into the history of treatments of neurological disorders and mental um, diseases, just to kind of give you an idea of where we've been, where we're going, and uh, you know where we are. And it, it's interesting about the treatments is that even in the you know the days of past where they sort of didn't know what to do or or they you know made holes in the skulls, um, those are still rel you know done today. So some of the treatments that we think are a bit barbaric are still actually carried out today, even though they're obviously under much better anesthetic and much better aseptic conditions. So, but a lot of the treatments that we use we're still you know following from the days of old. So I thought it'd be kind of fun just to walk through that a little bit and hopefully make it a little bit um, less heavy than some of these other ones. So when we were talking about stroke, about all the cell death and all those intracellular biochemical pathways, I thought that got a bit heavy into the real nitty gritty. So I kind of want to pull back and you know talk about more about funner, well, maybe fun stuff, who knows, we'll see. And then uh, MS, so um, again, just giving a brief overview of signs and symptoms, um, environmental factors. So there's some ideas about how MS comes about. One of those is vitamin D deficiency, so there's a higher incidence in people, in fact, in Canada and, um, and uh, the, the former Soviet Union. Um, and then the brain pathology, so what's happening to the brain as one you know, displays these signs and symptoms of MS. And then some of the treatments. And so the one that we'll focus on is this chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, or what uh, the media always called it was the <clears throat> liberation surgery. And it was carried out by a gentleman in Italy um, who had kind of discovered this. He, his name, in fact, is Zamboni. Um, but what he had found is that people, some, I, I think, in fact, all of his patients with MS had some blockage of the veins that drain from the brain, the blood from the brain back to the heart. And so when you open up those veins, the symptoms of MS seem to go away. And I think it's interesting that there was a lot of controversy over this. There still is. Um, and I, as I was mentioning to some of the other students in class, that I had a student who presented on this in one of my classes here at Carleton, and he was very much, um, you know, giving the spin that Zamboni was saying that, you know, he didn't believe in the autoimmune hypothesis, he didn't believe in all this, that it was all this blood flow idea. But if you actually look at the, the brain pathology, what's happening in MS, and then how this treatment is meant to aid in the symptoms, it, it actually does make sense. So the more I looked into it, the more it made sense to me. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and there are actually two people in this class who have actually had the surgery. So if we have any specific questions about this technique or this treatment, we can talk to them, because again, it's, it's still controversial. CHR, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, is reluctant to fund. I mean, actually, I think they're funding projects now to look into this, to do some clinical trials and clinical studies, but it's still, as I said, very uh, controversial and people who want this treatment often have to go outside of the country, which is never good. So let's start with epilepsy. So what is epilepsy? So there's really two different types of uh, seizures. What you would be, um, I guess the epilepsy and seizures are relatively synonymous. A seizure is actually the electrical discharges, and I guess epilepsy is more of the classification of the disorder, the brain disorder. So symptomatic seizures, are identified with a specific cause. So if you've had, let's say, a very high fever as a youngster or some infection or a, you know, a brain trauma, so what we were talking about last week about concussions, those will often set your brain up to develop seizure activity. So seizures are just overexcited, over um, hyperactive electrical activity in the brain. So something happens and this person all of a sudden has seizure activity you know, from there on forward. And there are particular causes that, or there are particular things that will set off that seizure activity that we'll talk about a little bit. And then the other one are the idiopathic um, seizures. So this appears spontaneously in the absence of other central nervous system diseases, as opposed to, you know, a head trauma, an idiopathic seizure will, all of a sudden it just seems to appear. And it's really unclear why that is happening. I mean, the more we get into it, the more we look into what's happening into the brain, we can actually understand why these seizures are coming about. And again, this is a, the idiopathic seizures are kind of interesting in terms of how these are treated. Um, you know, so either chemicals, so to stop the excitation, to increase the inhibition, or in fact, in severe cases, 
which again still happens today, but it's happened throughout history, is you remove that part of the brain that shows that hyperactive electrical activity, and that often stops those that seizure activity from happening. So I think in that respect, there's been a lot of understanding about basic functions of the brain when people have taken out parts of the brain because of seizures and you know done this in human cases. So there's a lot of history in this um, in this idea about the surgical treatment of seizure activity, and that's why I kind of wanted to talk a bit about that. So some of the factors that may precipitate seizures are, I mean, the way that I see this, it's anything. So, you know, I mean, in, on TV they often show that it's these uh, flashing lights or um, certain sounds or things like that, you know, over sensory stimuli, so things that are flashing all of a sudden set people off in seizures. And there was some indication of that, that there was some cartoon from Japan or China or somewhere like that where, you know, these flashing lights were coming on the screen and kids were having seizures. It's not just flashing lights. You can see that there's lots of other things, so different types of drugs, uh, fever, hormonal changes, um, you know, sleep deprivation, hyperventilation, all these different things that can actually set off uh, seizure activity. Yes? Sir, is a lobotomy, a lobotomy is that a uh, surgery for, uh, for yeah. Um, not for epilepsy, but I'm going to talk about lobotomies as we go along, because again, I think that's really related to this whole how we treat mental uh, diseases and disorders. So I'll get there. So this is, you know, sort of, I always find that this is interesting. The brain is most epileptogenic, so it's most prone to show the seizure patterns or show this over electrical activity when it is inactive, which again, the brain is typically never inactive, it's always active, but I guess what this is saying is more so when the patient is just sitting still and relaxed. So, you know, there's this spontaneous discharge of electrical activity and it just gets out of control and the brain can't stop it from going, it spreads throughout the brain and there's a, there's a seizure. So there are three common, I guess, what does that say, symptoms? I don't, I guess more is signs of a seizure. Um, and this first one, I think, this is where uh, Dr. Wilder Penfield had, you know, found his niche and under, you know, started to explore what parts of the brain were involved in seizure activity and to remove those parts to actually cure um, seizures or epilepsy. So this aura, so there's a warning sign or feeling. So there's a video that was on, um, you know, these one minute histories of Canada videos that I have that I'll show later, but the person in there, the woman before she had a seizure, she always smelled burnt toast. And so what Penfield surmised was that, well, that, that was an aura. So he said, well, if we can figure out where that sensation is coming from in the brain, then that's probably where the seizure activity is starting from. We remove that part of the brain and we should cure this person. And in fact, you know, he spent a good 10 years, if not more, of his life doing exactly that, having great success. And on the way, he actually mapped out the brain. So he did a lot, you know, from my perspective, he did a lot for mapping out the brain, for understanding the functions of the brain, but also for people with epilepsy, he cured them. So he was quite a big figure in the, in the 50s. <clears throat> so there's the aura, there's also loss of consciousness. Um, that's not always the case, so you'll see that there's different types of seizures. There's the grand mal seizures, there's petite mal seizures. The grand mal's are typically associated with loss of consciousness. Those are the ones that you'd see you know, on TV where the person starts shaking, falls to the ground, um, and has, you know, real full-blown um, electrical discharge seizure activity. But there's also a period of amnesia, so they forget everything that happened, you know, right before that event. So the brain essentially just goes into this massive electrical discharge and erases everything that's, uh, or overwrites everything that you've just uh, stored into memory. And in fact, it's kind of interesting to think about so again, seizures are a pattern of over electrical activity and one treatment for depression that we didn't talk about last time is this electroconvulsive therapy where they actually sit a person down and they still do this today and it's very effective and they just blast the brain with electrical activity and it essentially wipes out, the idea is that it wipes out everything that's been stored into memory, it produces this state of amnesia and you forget about those terrible events that have happened in your life. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, I'll, I, ruminating was kind of in depression. I get, I'll talk maybe a bit about that in lobotomies. We'll see if I can get to that, those ideas a bit. Um, 
So, so anyway, so then the other sign or symptom is a motor component. So again, that's the one that you associate with seizure activities, the shaking, uh, you know, hand rubbing, chewing. So all this, these electrical discharges that are happening in the brain, then affecting your motor system, so the output. And again, this is something, you know, thinking about the history of how people have studied the brain, you know, nobody knew that the, there was electrical activity in the brain. And what, you know, these investigators were doing, in fact, back in the days of Galvani, who actually, you know, studied electricity, he was the one who kind of discovered that, you know, he had some frog legs, in fact, hanging on a metal fence, and it was, he had them outside, and it was during an electrical storm, and, you know, lightning bolts were hitting the fence, and the frog legs were jumping. So he was the one to, you know, then put that together and say, okay, well, maybe there is electrical activity that controls our movements. And lo and behold, then, the more and more we understood this, the more we find out that when you have this overactivity, overactivity of electrical patterns in the brain, that causes these, you know, the shaking movement. So it's electrical activity that makes us move, and you can see that when you have abnormal electrical patterns. So you have abnormal movement. And this will come up when we talk about Parkinson's as well. So focal seizure is, this is the one that made, I guess, Penfield famous. Um, so it begins locally at a focus and then spreads out throughout the brain. So in Penfield's idea, so there was an aura, so this person smelled burnt toast, and he figured if I can, you know, poke this part of the brain that elicits the sensation, then that's the focus. That's where there's an abnormal piece of tissue that sets off this electrical activity and then that spreads throughout the brain. So he would remove that focus and the person would be cured. And there was a famous patient, HM, who had exactly this that I'll talk about, because I think, again, with HM's case, it opened a whole new world for how we study uh, memory and how I, in fact, study memory. So this is the, one of the most common seizures is a temporal lobe seizure. Um, and I, there's some really interesting work coming out of uh, a lab, this um, Ramachandran uh, professor out in California, I think he's at Berkeley, not sure, but he studies these temporal lobe seizures, the, and it's more of a minor seizure, so it just gives this hallucination. And, um, and again, it, the subjective experience that precedes the attack, so like an aura, but in what Ramachandran says is that this is, people will hallucinate visions of God, visions of religious figures, and this explains all these, you know, sightings of religious figures that people have throughout the world that in fact they're having a temporal lobe seizure. So it's kind of an interesting way to look at the world. Um, so anyways, but the temporal lobe, so again, this is one of the most famous um, places where a focal seizure came out and it was removed by Pen one of Penfield's students and then another one of Penfield's psychology students actually understood what was wrong with this patient, discovered that this temporal lobe was really important for memory formation. The gentleman had no more seizures, he also had no more memory. So it was a really fascinating case. So generalized seizures, so these are the, the grand mal seizures are the big, the granddaddies of them all in fact, and these are very difficult, so as it is a generalized seizure, it doesn't seem to have any real focal point, so you can't just remove a particular piece of tissue. Um, it's, I mean, people, you know, treat it with drugs that will increase the inhibition in the brain because, again, seizure activity is overexcitation, it's high levels of electrical activity, so what you want to do is stop that electrical activity from happening, and that will hopefully calm the brain down. There's a lot of reasons why, you know, the brain becomes overactive, but I don't think I'll get into those too much, but just to get, you know, so you to get an understanding that these grand mal seizures are this massive amount of electrical discharge in the brain, and then you go into this, you know, stiffening phase, you, you know, you stop, you go into this tonic stage, then clonic, and that's the rhythmic shaking that you often see, people fall down um, and, you know, basically shake. And then the, the post-seizure state of confusion, so the amnesia and everything else that happens when you have this massive electrical discharge in your brain. So, the, so those are really, you know, obviously clearly visible. The petite malls are a bit more difficult because oftentimes you wouldn't even notice that a person had a seizure. So they're, you know, it's characterized by a loss of awareness with no motor activity, but there's some blinking, turn of the head, rolling of the eyes. It's really quick. Um, but the problem is, is that these small seizures, if they go either untreated or unnoticed, <clears throat> can actually lead up to these grand mal types. So essentially your brain um, gets 
programmed from these smaller seizures to lead up into these big seizures. It's, it's a process called kindling that, in fact, a gentleman at Ag Carlton was studying for quite some time. He retired recently, but he would look at essentially animal models and give them just brief electrical stimulation in certain parts of the brain and then see how, over time, that built up to these grand mal seizures. So it's like those mini strokes lead up to giant strokes. You know, it's always these smaller things that we don't notice that then can lead to uh, bigger issues. So in fact, I just wanted to put this up to show it. I mean, it's essentially the, the thing to get out of this is just the electrical patterns, the electrical activity. So at, you know, essentially what's happening is you have these, this quiet sort of electrical activity being recorded from the brain and they, people just record from different parts of the brain. And then when the seizure actually starts, you can see that it goes from this you know, low level to all of a sudden it's just all this you know, high level of electrical activity in the brain. And then it gets really sort of desynchronized and then it starts to calm down. So there's, you know, it, there's probably the different stages of the grand mal seizure that are you know, illustrated there, but I think the important thing is to show that you know, at rest or at normal brain waves, we, you know, it, we're pretty calm. Our brain is actually quite well controlled in terms of electrical activity. But as the seizure progresses, then that excitation takes over or you lose that inhibition. So there's an imbalance. And then the seizure starts to take off. And then things can just go pretty much haywire in the, throughout the brain. So treatments, so mostly again like where we are right now is giving drugs that inhibit that discharge of abnormal neurons. So pharmacological agents that will stop that over electrical or hyper activity, hyper electrical activity, stabilize the brain and then you know let those inhibitory neurons take over to sort of stop that over electrical discharge. That's, I mean essentially this is where we are right now, is giving these medications to people to treat that, those are the electrical discharges. But I think the other one that is still, you know, historically has been really a highlight of, you know, understanding brain function, and it still happens today, and people still study the brain when they're, you know, doing these surgeries on individuals, is that they remove a part of the brain where the focus is. So wherever it starts, and again, typically in this uh, temporal lobe, down in here, so if this is the front of the brain, this is the back, there's, for whatever reason, again, this temporal lobe, so this is another, I think, interesting part of the brain, aside from the frontal lobe, is that the temporal lobe seems to be really highly active, so it's really important for us to form memories, but, you know, and when we form memories, we have to have some increase in the electrical activity. If that electrical activity goes unchecked, then it can set off a seizure, and people Surgeons, then, <clears throat> if these drugs don't work, they'll go in and they'll remove that part of the brain. Yep? So, how does the concentration, concentration, deep concentration, really? Uh, I, yeah, I can't, um, I can't go into that level at this point. <laughs> That's, um, well, maybe as we, maybe we can talk about it after a little bit. I think that's something for, uh, because I, I do want to get through the sort of the historical bent on how we treat mental diseases and uh, neurological disorders. So again, so the surgical removal again, I think, has been, and that I'm going to talk about the uh, temporal or the lobotomies as well, because that was a way to actually, you know, sort of control uh, mental diseases. So treatment overview. So where we are. So this is now 2013. Essentially, pharmaceuticals are the the drug of choice. So the treatment of choice for seizures, and I'm going to expand this out now to make it a bit more broad to you know all sort of neurological disorders, all mental um, diseases, so or disorders. So drugs that have been used have been developed by big pharmaceutical companies to get into the brain and stabilize either neurotransmitter deficiencies or imbalances or electrical um, disturbances. If the pharmaceuticals don't work. There's always that option of surgery, and this is still, again, carried out quite uh, regularly today. But in the past, it's been essentially the same. So surgery was probably the more prominent way of dealing with um, mental health issues or neurological disorders. Pharmaceuticals less so. Pharmaceuticals were used, but they're really in the you know experimental trials. 
not very effective at all, not very specific, caused some pretty bad side effects. So you can see where you know surgery was the mainstay, and as we progress through time, pharmaceuticals become more of the mainstay, surgery becomes the secondary way to uh, treat, let's say, uh, brain disorders, we'll say. So where we are going, probably will still be stuck, not stuck, but we'll still rely on pharmaceuticals as our main way to treat brain diseases, brain disorders. Surgery will probably still be around because it's historically it's shown quite effective results or outcomes. But now we get into biotech and there's a lot of really interesting findings. In fact, a finding that was just, that came out this week on stem cell replacement in, uh, in MS. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because I think, I mean, it, it just so happened, you know, that it came out this week, not only on stem cells, but also, you know, obviously a topic that I'm gonna to be talking about today. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of promise in biotechnology and stem cells um, and lots of other sort of newer ways of treating the brain, of getting things into the brain to help, you know, balance out disorders. So again, I don't want to um, belabor on this too much, but just a bit more on epilepsy. So probably more down here, 0.6% of the Canadian population has epilepsy. Um, people who are taking anticonvulsant drugs, so have it under control, don't display symptoms. Or the other portion of that 0.6% is people have had a seizure within the past five years. Um, and so I th actually, this is kind of a nice way. It's a brief change in how the brain works. So it's an electrical discharge that really just throws the brain um, out, of, out of control, out of homeostasis, and then it leads to all those different uh, symptom patterns, so motor output and uh, you know, amnesia. So this is, you know, there are different types of things that can cause a seizure. Um, 50 to 60% is unknown. So that's those, those are those idiopathic seizures that we don't really know why this seizure activity is taken off. The other, I guess, 50 to 40%, which is still, it's still about half, you know, brain tumors or strokes can lead to seizures, head trauma, I'd already put up that, infections. Um, so this one, brain injury to the infant during delivery may lead to epilepsy. I knew a guy who had, when he was born, he didn't remember this, but he, his mom told him <laughs> that when he was born, he actually, what happened is he had a stroke. So it, the blood was, cut off, I guess, and I mean, clearly you can see how that can happen if you get the umbilical cord wrapped around your neck. So he had, in fact, had a stroke when he was being born, and then later on he had epilepsy because of that, because of the uh, stroke. So, you know, it's essentially what can happen is if you have, you know, if you think about stroke, you get all the blood, you know, cut off to that particular part of the brain, and that tissue starts to die, but it could be only those inhibitory control <laughs> systems that actually die off and then lead to um, seizure activity or epilepsy. And then poisoning, substance abuse, alcoholism. So I, when I talked about alcohol, you know, I'd said that alcohol is very effective in inhibiting brain activity, but when you become an alcoholic, it goes in the opposite direction. So then inhibitory processes in your brain actually stop for some, I mean, it's just the way that your brain deals with all this alcohol coming in, and oftentimes alcoholics, chronic alcoholics, will have epilepsy and seizures. So the triggers, again, you know, there's lots of different triggers that it's not just flashing lights, it's not just sensory inputs, it's all these things. I mean, obviously flickering lights is one, but, you know, being hungry, illness, fever, lack of sleep, emotions, heat or humidity, lots of things can, you know, I mean, everything that is up here, all those sensory inputs come into the brain, everything affects the brain, and if you have a part of the brain that's not responding properly, then it can go into this over, um, activity. So drugs are the major treatment right now, long-term drug therapy. Drugs are not a cure and have numerous side effects. So, you know, historically, people have tested all these different types of drugs, found these really pretty bad side effects. But now that we get to understand how the brain works a bit better, we can develop more specific drugs with fewer side effects. But again, there's, you know, to have a drug is to have a side effect. There's no way around that. Currently. So brain surgery is recommended only when medications fail. So again, it, and this is something that, you know, even in the 1950s, Dr. Penfield realized that you have to be able to safely remove that brain tissue without damaging personality or function. And, you know, oftentimes that was like, oops, we, you know, we changed their personality, we changed their function. And that often happened with the, the case of lobotomies. 
So that's why I want to put that up there as sort of a you know a lesson that we should all remember because I think you know while brain surgery is the secondary way to treat a lot of disorders currently, medications do become the primary source. But again, what people don't often look at is how a medication can you know be safely administered for the long term without producing damage or you know changing a person's personality, and much so the case in children when we're giving them you know medications to treat brain function or you know some personality issue that we don't like so ADHD let's say what happens when those that person is on that medication for you know during these critical periods and then for the rest of their lives okay so I'll get off my soapbox so where have we been <laughs> so way back in the old days so there is an there was an Egyptian record known as the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus so I think this is a really you know, again, just thinking about historically how people have treated the brain, there's something that I find fascinating about this. One of the cases that I came across in this papyrus is that um, it's, a, it's, it's very similar to how we treat some injuries today. So there was a documentation of 26 cases of brain injury along with various treatment uh, recommendations. So again, this is just, um, just a bit of a background, but I think this is interesting that even in 3000 BC, these Egyptians were differentiating between rational surgical treatments and medical magical measures. So, you know, again, I think it, there's something to be learned about this is that, you know, do we have these rational treatments for individuals or is it sort of like, okay, let's see what this does, let's see what that does. And that's often the case. So it, it almost verges on that medical magical outcome. So this is, the, this is the quintessential case that I like to show, and it actually follows up nicely from the, uh, the concussion lecture. So case eight, instructions concerning smash in his skull under the skin of his head. So this again, so the examination, I, I mean, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, it, but it, it's, it's kind of entertaining, I guess. Um, examest the man having a smash of his skull. So shouldst thou find that there is a swelling, protruding, on the outside of that smash, which is a skull, while his eye is askew. So, you know, essentially this individual, somehow, I don't know what the state of the environment was in 3000 BC, but I guess this was probably kind of a common occurrence that people would get, you know, traumatic brain injuries. So essentially what we've been, what we've been talking about. So it's interesting, walks shuffling with his soul on the side of him having that injury, which is in his skull. So they, you know, they were still, um, I mean, they were actually starting to link up that the brain was, in fact, important for the control of uh, bodily functions, which was not really a popular idea back in those days. So the diagnosis is um, is a bit funny. I don't. So again, it's uh, I don't know where there's. Oh, so I guess even discharged blood from both his nostrils, from his ears, suffers with stiffness in his neck, an ailment not to be treated. Although the treatment, and this is where I think it's quite interesting. His treatment is sitting until he gains color, and until thou knowest, he has reached the decisive point. So it's, which I, which is really kind of instructive in terms of, you know, how we try to treat concussions because we don't know how to treat concussions. So essentially, for the treatment of some of these brain injuries like a concussion, we tell them to not do anything, to sit quietly, to not engage in mental activity or physical activity, and then. What is the decisive point? Well, we'll know. You know, we'll know when they're ready, when they're recovered. So it's still, it kind of goes back to this, you know, 3000 BC, they were, they didn't really know how to properly treat the brain. And even today, we don't really know how to properly treat something like a concussion. So then we move up a thousand years. So the pre-Incan civilizations, the trepanation um, using surgical tools. So somebody, which was very nice, brought in a skull with a trepanation hole in it, which is amazing. So that's how big it is. So actually, it's pretty close to that. So and there was, um, this is apparently the tool. So we were trying to figure out what the tool, actually how you get in there. But I guess you can scrape away the skull. You can probably pick at it. And you can essentially make a hole. So as it says that, you know, it may be used for both spiritual, magical reasons, but treating headaches, epilepsy, mental illness. So it was basically the cure all. So I'm just going to bring up epilepsy. But again, what is what's instructive about this? That's a pretty big hole. What's instructive about this 